but Society of St. James, a Hampshire-based charity, was founded in 1972 by establishing a night shelter for homeless men in a church hall in Southampton, followed by a soup run in the city every evening of the year. Currently, the Society runs a number of services for the homeless across Hampshire. It isn't just about putting a roof over people's heads, but about giving them the skills necessary to step back into the world as someone more independent. The Society offers opportunities to address the issues which have led to individuals becoming homeless. Sid has been attached to the Society for years and years, and the staff that worked here are very much his family. Some nice tattoos. Do they, I've got both of them. Do they represent anything? Uh, I've got these in Nick, Norwich Nick, these. Can't make you see the tattoo artist, I'm sorry. They can show me full of photograph all this shots. Yeah. Here's more of the tea tape and all the ass you want. Yeah, they get the toilet paper, put it down, wet it all, and it comes up like that. So all they've got to do is uh, the needle. And just uh, that, and all the bus coming in, the cop there and he goes, ah, and wipes the bus away. Hugh, a former footballer with Rangers FC in the 1950s and affectionately known as Drummer by his friends, played with the likes of Aka Bilk in jazz clubs around the world. What are you saying about Portsmouth? Uh, and the fact that they've got the... Um... I got drunk one day, and, uh, and I got left in Churchill Avenue, went to Churchill Avenue again, and I got taken in, but he never charged me on that. He gave me a nice talking to him. Any particular memory from your time at Rangers? Uh, playing, you know. Thanks for playing against Celtic. That was the match you used to look forward to, the local derby. The Southampton Street Intensive Hostel aims to support the homeless who may have had a history of alcohol, drug or mental health complications. The hostel aims to provide at least six months of support to help residents back onto their feet and move them on to more independent accommodation. The staff at work here are renowned for their commitment to improving their residents' lives and guiding them back to their own home. Here, Andy talks about his own journey and his current role as a project worker at the hostel. Okay, do you know what? I don't want to go back to fitting carpets because I've done that all my life and there's another way, but I'd go and do anything rather than work here sometimes. Yeah? And I say to myself, if I'd go and do anything, why can't I work here? Because it's not about what it is I'm doing, it's about what it is I'm thinking and feeling. Yeah? Um, it's, it, it's not about me working here, it's not about me really, you know, it, there's more chance of me actually going and using it with, with, with working here than there is going work, working in the field, working with cows and that sort of thing. Do you think so? Um, it's in the it's in the here and now. Today's good. You know, I've now got, I'm now going through this. I've I've um, been to a treatment centre uh, a few days ago, and they won't talk about a drink or a drug now, because yeah? it's not about where I'm going, where I've come from. It's about where I am and where I'm going to. Yeah. And I don't get bored in an evening and say to myself, I'll go to a meeting, so I've got nothing else to do. Mm -hmm. yeah? Because what I'm doing is saying. I've got nothing else to do, I need to go to a meeting so I don't use, because I'm relating myself to being an addict all the time. Well, I'm not in active addiction all the time. Going to a meeting is about somebody which can't stop, so I'm going to go to a meeting to help somebody, yeah? which I do, which I still give back, and I'm accountable to that. And I can, I can go through phases of doing maybe two meetings a week sometimes, just because of the balance of life, of what it is that I've got, and what I'm getting from and giving to the meeting. You know? um, so I go, right, okay, well, I look, at my, I look at what it is I'm doing and I need to have balance and so if I'm still doing enough of what it is I'm giving back to others and what, I'm, what it is I'm doing for my therapy to keep myself connected with God, which is what it's about, what's going on in here, I go and see my mum, I go and see my brother, I go and see people that I haven't, I make phone calls to people, I do the chores because sometimes, yeah, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to have to do my chores at a weekend, so I won't, I actually go and do some playful things and go and help, you know, go and have some fun with people and I didn't do the washing that I should have done at the weekend, so I'm not going to go to a meeting tonight. It's not because I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to not go because I haven't got anything to do. What can I do now? 
Where am I going to go to? It's about where am I going opposed to where have I been. On the 27th of March 2013, Andover College hosted The Big Sleep Out. The Big Sleep Out also contributed a large sum of money which went to Hampshire based charities. Meridian News came and conducted an interview with the organiser and also members of the Sleep Out. Temperatures tonight will probably drop to minus three or four degrees again, so while you're tucked up in bed in your warm house, Spare a thought for those who live on the streets. A group of students who want to raise awareness of the plight of those who sleep rough have decided to see exactly how hard it can be. They are with Simon Parkin in Andover this evening. Yes, yeah, Simon, what's going on with you? Well, you know what it's like, Phil. Uh, students have a reputation for spending every day in bed. Not this lot. They're not going to get hardly any sleep tonight because they're doing a sleep out. Jem, it was all your idea. Well, it, it started as a result of a social action project which the media students at the college are organising this year and the purpose behind that was to raise awareness and hopefully some funds for the Society of St James which is a Hampshire based charity which provides services for homeless people across Hampshire. And of course across the whole of the Meridian region, homeless figures are on the up. They are. There was a report out on the 12th of February to suggest that the numbers of people sleeping rough on the streets of the UK has increased by 31%. Which is a frightening number, isn't it? it? Is, and, it is. and I guess when you plan to do the sleep out, you're thinking it's going to be spring, nearly Easter, the weather's not going to be too bad. That was the idea, but of course, over the last sort of, I think, 10 days or so, temperatures have plummeted, and I think we're looking at minus figures tonight, aren't we? So Yeah, I'll tell you when we do the forecast, but certainly it's too cold to be wearing a T-shirt, <laughs> I would have thought. But uh, let's go and meet some of the other students who are, are braving the elements tonight. Uh, Amy, Dana and Ellie, how many layers, first of all, have you got on? A lot, yeah. <laughs> We've got our hats, gloves, scarves. Loads of extra coats, sleeping bags, cardboard. Do you think you're going to stay warm? Hopefully. <laughs> okay. and, and, and as far as having an affinity with people who are genuinely homeless, do you think you are going to feel what they feel? I think we'll definitely feel a lot. It's just we get to look forward to having a shower in the morning and going to bed. But um, it shows that this is really hard and they have to go through this every day. So, so one night is kind of fairly easy. Yeah, but I'm still quite scared. <laughs> and rightly so. And, and if you maybe can't sleep and you're getting too cold, can you can you wash out? Um, well, we can go in the music academy, but as long as we take care of ourselves and are sensible, then it should be fine and we're not going to wash out, so... Famous last words. Do you think yeah. you're actually going to get anything resembling sleep, though? No. no. I'm not counting on it. Maybe half an hour. Half an hour. Well, that'll probably be enough. Well, um, Gem, I mean, it's an admirable thing that you're doing here and it, it is to raise money as well, isn't it? it? And you don't need a lot of money to help homeless people. Indeed, we're talking about for every £40 that's raised, and we're looking to have achieved somewhere in the region of £400 already, um, £40 is enough to provide a night's accommodation and three hot meals for a homeless person. So Fantastic. Anybody that wants to pop along and drop a few quid down to support the work we're okay. doing, that Well, good luck, and Thank let's you. see how cold that weather is going to be tonight. So Andover College, where I work, has a population of around about 1,000 students. Uh, and I think what's quite interesting actually is that they are there is estimated to be somewhere in the region of a thousand people sleeping rough on the streets of the UK every single night of the year and that stark statistic was one which I used right at the very beginning of the year uh, when talking to the students about homelessness but our understanding of homelessness in the UK, I think, needed to be contextualised. And so I had the opportunity, along with a further nine uh, people across Hampshire, to venture off to India in May, uh, where I took on the personal challenge of spending three days climbing the Himalayas uh, in India, and then spending three days working in Delhi uh, with 
the homeless population there and to illustrate the huge problem of homelessness in India in Delhi alone there are an estimated 250,000 people uh, who are street homeless. Housing is a basic human need, yet the statistics of the United Nations Commission on Human Rights in 2005 notes that an estimated 100 million people, that's one quarter of the world's population, live without shelter or in unhealthy and unacceptable conditions. Of that 100 million, at least 78 million people are homeless in India. This is in spite of the country growing in global terms. It currently ranks as the 53rd poorest country in the world. However, more than 90 million people in India make less than 30 rupees a day, the equivalent of about 40 pence. The number of people living in slums in India has more than doubled in the past two decades and now exceeds the entire population of Britain. The Indian government has announced that the number of people living in slums is projected to rise to 93 million or 7.75% of the total population, this being almost double the population of Britain. The health consequences of this level of homelessness are profound. Charitable organisations in India state that of the 78 million homeless people there, 11 million of them are children who live on the streets. What is worse is that very little is known of what it means to be part of such horrific numbers. The statistics are grim. Seeing the sheer magnitude of, of people, it was just uh, in, in, incredible and the sort of I think one of the things that struck me first of all was the carousing kind of pipes and wires that were sort of hanging uh, above the, the streets and sort of labyrinth of alleys and kind of sort of passageways that there were in the market area of Delhi itself and it just kind of made me think my god if there's a power cut how <laughs> the hell do they sort it out and that was really uh, a taste of Delhi itself having people coming up to you wanting to kind of carry your bag for you know 20 rupees 30 rupees and I think what was quite stark uh, something that I learned was that there are somewhere in the region of you know 250,000 people in Delhi alone who earn less than 30 rupees a day which is the equivalent of around about 35 40 pence to us uh, here in the UK, so the extent of the poverty was really quite hard to articulate and explain actually, it's, it's something that I think you just, you, f you feel when you kind of sort of see it uh, there. Uh, no rest for the wicked, uh, we took an overnight train uh, down to Dharamashala um, which was about a 10 hour overnight uh, train uh, ride and from there the following morning we had a day uh, in Dharamashala which is where the Dalai Lama uh, resides and that was a, a very uh, interesting experience seeing uh, monks kind of walking up and down the road um, and then the following day we spent three days climbing the Himalayas, which was uh, a huge kind of personal challenge for me given the fact that I'm a smoker, I'm not particularly fit uh, and indeed the second day I was really quite ill a result of being kind of dehydrated I think um, and there were certainly kind of moments throughout those three days when I did kind of feel like what the hell have I taken on, this is painful, this is difficult um, but I think that once I got back to Delhi after three days everything kind of gets put into perspective because we then spent three days uh, working in a building which had been set aside by a local Indian charity to provide room, shelter and bed space for the most vulnerable 
uh, people uh, in India. And our job really was to clean and make a space habitable for those people. So I was working with uh, nine other people who I'd not met before, all from Hampshire, uh, many of them doing very different jobs to me. There was a DJ, uh, somebody who works in IT, uh, there was a corporate solicitor with us, um, and we all rolled up our sleeves and painted a room um, and made it habitable for people that are going to be residing there. What was interesting about the, the project in, in India, uh, very similar to the Society of St James in, in Southampton, was that they are trying to create a place where people can feel empowered to take responsibility for themselves, to have a voice, if you like. And in the last couple of years, we were able to uh, come up with a solution to provide the shelters, to provide the healthcare, to provide the basic identity, especially with the voting rights and the banking services and the education to the children and this mental health issue. So every aspect of the human's hopeless life. This is one of the most beautiful parts. And another most beautiful part of our work is we are sustaining it for the last 13 years without stopping, without breaking. But I think that, again, uh, the thing in India which was, was really shocking was the extent to which they don't have the facilities and the and the and the resources to which you and I are take for granted. On our third day there, the day before we were going to kind of leave and fly back to the UK, John, who was the leader of the group, actually asked us if we had any paracetamol, any plasters, any ibuprofen, stuff from our first aid kits, which we would like to donate to the project very simply because they, the local charity out there doesn't even have the resources to provide people with simple things like painkillers. Well, we only, um, we only raise about 3% of the society's income overall, so the society is still predominantly funded centrally. But what the department does is raise all of the money that kind of plugs <coughs> gaps or um, that enables us to provide projects that are over and above what's required of us, the things that make a real difference to people's lives. So obviously putting a roof over somebody's head or putting them through some kind of rehabilitation programme or working with the probation service on people who are consistently reoffending, those kind of things are very important. But to make a real difference for um, helping somebody to take steps to transform their lives, you need to be offering things over and above the basics. So an example of the kind of project that we fund would be um, our Saints for Sport project. Now what that is, is a partner project with the Saints Foundation, who are the charity arm of Southampton Football Club. Um, and it provides free to the client access to sporting activity, um, into education, accredited qualifications and now pathways into employment. Um, that project wouldn't exist without the fundraising department, so um, I guess that's, that's why we exist. Do you, do you think that this experience has like, changed any views on homeless people you had before? Yeah, I think so actually, because um, I think sometimes people have a misconception, um, which I've had to dispel myself um, to others in raising funds for the charity, in that, oh well, it's your fault. And actually, quite often it's not their fault. Um, so I've heard about instances where you've got people actually quite quite well off um, and then they get made redundant and 
they've got no income coming in, they can't pay their rent, and it spirals down from there. And so it's not actually just, you know, you're addicted to drugs or, you know, so you've got a habit, so you've, you know, swindled all your money and now you're homeless. It's, it's not always about that. And I think that's something that a lot of people still don't understand. In terms of the actual challenge itself, um, probably there was one particular day which I found quite um, challenging and that was actually not the what was billed to be the most challenging day. I think that was the second day of the trek where we were going through endless boulders and old sort of dried up riverbeds just literally ascending and you, you couldn't see an end to it. I think that was, that was the thing and, and I think the day before we'd only had kind of a three or four hour yeah. trek on the first day so that was the first proper day of getting into it and I think um, that was perhaps a little bit of a shock. But in terms of um, back in Delhi I actually found the first afternoon that we went to the homeless project quite a, a challenge in my own head about goodness me look at this I mean the, the job that I do I do obviously deal with people um, in buying and selling businesses and things but ultimately they're companies they're, they're entities you know things with money swishing around in them so actually dealing with people on a level personally um, is not something that I do massively often in my day to day life and, you know socially I do but obviously not to see it as hard hitting as it was when we went into the into the um, the shelter and there was a chap there with a bandage um, and he had mouth cancer and he had a really large gaping hole in his face um, with maggots coming out of it and you know to see that sort of thing and to see that that's the way people live was I just well it got me. Was he like one of the main characters that got to you or did you meet like anyone that you kind of really made a connection with on any level or? Um, I mean there was there were two chaps. There was there was that one guy with the bandage around his head and then there was another guy who had a mental um, mental illness and he was just so keen on helping and I felt it was because He's sort of thinking, well, these people are coming in and, and you know restoring our room, but I want to take a bit of pride in my space. And I felt that constantly he would he would be sort of telling people, well, put put down that broom and picking things up to help out. And it was because he wanted to take a bit of ownership and a bit of pride in, in what we were doing. I think the other thing that I found. I don't even know the word, shocking seems kind of a cheap word to use really, was the significant number of orphans, street children, who uh, were homeless. Um, and in the building next to where we were working, it appeared to kind of be an orphanage where the children would gather. And certainly they were uh, clean, the staff, that work there, the local Indian charity, um, were, were, were certainly, you know, doing the children a good service. They were clean and presentable, but it was just, you know, it tugged at the heartstrings, I guess, to see uh, children who don't have the the type of experiences that I guess that we in the United Kingdom, for the most part, take for granted. If you uh, if you could give, and I'm saying to you, you can give three 17, 18 year old lads in front of you a bit of advice for the world. What would it be? What would it be if you went something like football or music? 
go in, put your head down and don't look up and you'll get there. Don't do anything half-hearted. Do anything half-hearted, you, 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 you may as well not try it at all. Get in there, if you love what you're doing, just get in there and get your head down and you'll be a success. I know love for a fight.